you. My friend. How are you? Good. Good. Frank, um, I have a, uh, scarcely enough time to, I think, really kind of, uh, you know, mention all the things that I kind of I'm thinking to discuss with you. Sure. Um, uh, I think that there's an aspect of uh, of you and your work that actually, and I wanted to say this even back then, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. That you're like the, the you're in many ways you're kind of like the filmmaker inside the poet because your your descriptions are so psychologically visual. Mm -hmm. Good. You know, I like the term psychologically. Visual. Yeah, exactly. As opposed to, you know, exactly. Right. And then, uh, and and what I think, a, what a lot of what James does is he's actually maybe in some ways an aspiring individual to get the poet yeah. inside yes. the filmmaker. Right. I mean, I think of you as two mm -hmm. sides of the same coin in so mm -hmm. many ways. Do you think that that's there's a there's a correlation there? Well, you know, I wanted to be a filmmaker when I was in high school. Oh. And uh, at first, I mean, when I was qu quite young, I thought, oh, I wanted to be an actor. And then I realized at a certain point, I don't know, by the time I was 12 or something, that directors really made films. And I, all through uh, high school, I wanted to uh, be a film director. And um, this was the late 50s. Um, I realized at a certain point that um, I think the films I wanted to make would never be successful in Hollywood, would never get made. Uh, and um, I'd been an English graduate student at Riverside, University of California, Riverside. I had great teachers. Um, and um, I didn't want to go to film school. Um, I didn't know what to do. Uh, I'm one of these people that growing up I felt I had to be an artist or die. But I really didn't. I thought, thought it was going to be film. I'd been spent years trying to write poems, which I didn't think were any good. Um, and uh, a professor of mine, uh, Tom Edwards, a great person, a great man, uh, told me to go to Harvard. He, I started graduate school in, uh, in 1962 at Harvard. And um, slowly, uh, really in my second and third year, it came to be poems that I could make that corresponded to what was compelling my mind and what, what I was obsessed with. Um, and I think I'm really not a filmmaker, but I think I think about the materials of art in many ways the way filmmakers do. My poems are often made up of scenes they flow into each other in a way that uh, film is taught us can be done. And, um, uh, but I think, you know, there's a line, I think it's in Socrates or Plato, uh, 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 quoting Socrates, that uh, the poetry is the mind's dialogue with itself. And I felt that um, I could capture something of, of the contours of that dialogue of the mind with itself. Um, uh, in a poem more truly than I, than I could have in a film. In any case, I never made a film, so I don't know what kind of film I, I, I would have made. Um, but I like the fact that James could find in my poems um, uh, something that caught his mind. And I think my poems are more, they're more made up of scenes, they are made up of, of, of a kind of drama. Uh, anyway, that pleased me very much. I certainly know when the first time James and I talked, we had this long dinner, which went on for about eight hours, uh, uh, I felt this tremendous uh, similarity of mind in terms of the way we thought about many things. And he was interested in the world I knew about, which was poetry and poets. And I was terrifically interested in uh, the world he knew about, which was not only literature, but, uh, but Hollywood and stories about actors. He loves stories about actors. He's interested in how actors became who they are. Um, and... Um, 
and I adored all that. So we just had this amazingly interesting conversation where, where I wanted to learn about his world, and he seemed to want to learn about mine. Uh, and he says something about what he got from you, which I, I, I think was an extraordinary treasure. Uh, he said that f from you he learned how to describe extreme interstates through extreme persons. Oh, and he used that at, good. as a way of developing personas good. in his own acting, good. in his own writing, which I think uh, good. not many people could claim to have been that kind of an influence. I think I had... Um, you know, I didn't learn. I didn't develop that out of a vacuum. Uh, I think if you read Shakespeare, that that's what you find in Shakespeare. What he does is uh, he he shows you, um, you know, in extreme states of being, extreme actions that are in fact the outward embodiment of things all people feel: uh, ambition, jealousy, love, um, uh, and um, uh, there's a narrative context right. in which they become, uh, it's necessary to enact them. And um, so all those things are behind these these ideas. It's not extremity for its own sake, but extremity as the embodiment, the outward enactment of things that are private and for most people not enacted, but nonetheless are true of everybody, of everyone. Uh, um, Yeats is also very useful in this. Uh, Yeats' idea of the anti self, mm -hmm. and that you discover yourself by the embodiment of uh, of a consciousness that is not you. Not, but it's not irrelevantly not you. It is the inverse of you. It's the inverse. That's yeah. right. That's right. Um, but you had an additional dimension, which I have to, uh, which I have to say is very important, which is that. Um, there's a way in which how, the way that you write the the protagonist often carries something from the past mm -hmm. whose source we are not entirely clear about. Right. But and and he's not clear about. And he's not clear about. That's right. And which in the present is hidden right. in some way that others don't get. That's right. But and I'm not only referring to Herbert White. That's obviously an extreme. Right. But even in metaphysical dog, I just saw that again and again. I right. mean, so many ways in which you even do that with your own past. Well, I think because I think that's true of our experience. I mean, we feel the force of something from the past, but we don't understand it entirely. We don't understand its cause. We don't understand how it acts in us. We discover it partly by enactment by uh, learning what it, what, what it has done to us and we have done with it. Um, and then the other thing I have to also though say, mm -hmm. Frank, is that you're very careful uh, to... Um, you're very careful to be as direct and as real in your use of language and your depiction of that situation, of that, that interface between outer and inner, as mm -hmm. it were, which can in many cases be such a vast distance, you're always very careful never to let the poetic language mm -hmm. be the, the main point. The end, or, right. the, or the main point, yeah. And that's, that is so much more difficult to do. Well, because I, 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 I really dislike poetic language that becomes a screen, that becomes an end in itself. Um, and, you know, often a character in Shakespeare will uh, have a tremendous sense of the possibilities of rhetoric uh, and language, but there's always something much more uh, driven beneath it. Uh, that's not, that's end is not simply language, and um, and really, I mean he, Shakespeare is the greatest writer because he embodies this more fully than any any other poet anyway. Um, uh, and, but you know, but let me let me say I think one thing that connects James uh, and me is that. Um, 
James in a way that is startling and startles me often tells the truth, particularly about um, painful things, about sexual issues. He really does not lie. And that's very startling from an actor, from a movie star. You expect movie stars to lie. And he does not lie. Um, and I think that's become part of his power, the power of the, the, the identity he's created for himself. But it's very unusual. I mean, it, it absolutely is a departure from uh, any model I can think of uh, uh, of, uh, of, of celebrities. Um, and, um, uh, and that's something I respond to very much in him and I think it's also one of the things I hope that he finds uh, at least some version of in, in my work. Right, yeah. because I think that the arresting immediacy mm -hmm. of this emotional truth that's coming mm -hmm. out is delivered with no pretense. Mm -hmm. Good, uh, good. I would like that. Yeah, and I, would and like I that think very that much. You know, he really, uh, uh, all of his work really stands in some ways against the feature film careerism. Yeah. But see, but you, okay, but, but you do something that for all the, for all of the directness does have a bit of non-directness, which is you reach for symbolism. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't mean metaphysical symbolism, but I mean, it's no. clearly like, no, you yes, know, no. it's and a pattern. I, absolutely. And right. that idea is what I think was very exciting to James mm -hmm. when he then turned around and looked at mm -hmm. Lester Ballard in Child of God, you mm -hmm. know, yes. and Ramirez, and yes. all these, like, you know, he says, like, you know, looking at all these people who would do these terrible things, I'm not interested in that because it turns me on or anything, but because right. in some ways it goes in. And right. so the idea, for example, with Herbert White, which I'm sure you've discussed so many times mm -hmm. in so many different ways, but I mean, the adaptations, uh, that he sort of puts that through are so clearly designed to show you both Herbert White as this, um, if you like, this diegetic, this level of mm -hmm. however the character wants to be defined, you know, mm -hmm. which is the sort of, the, I don't know if you like, maybe the psychosexually repressed strange sociopath right. on the one hand. And then at the same time, he, through Michael Shannon, is hiding something else. Right. Which I think he reserves specifically for how you design the poem mm -hmm. and how you actually, I think, um, intended to humanize. I think maybe the aspects of this character, right. whose um, I guess maybe struggles had a lot more to, than to do with just his own compulsion, but maybe the world's own moral codes. Right. But in a way, it's it's a strange because the poem can be explicit about the way and what what he wants is meaning. And the film doesn't do that. The film is not explicit about those. But somehow, both James and Shannon, James through Shannon, is able to communicate something like that, that it has a, um, uh, a, a dimension that is beyond uh, uh, simply narrative uh, particularity, and uh, a, a dimension that's beyond... Um, uh, psychology. See, like I, right, I mean, I had seen, um, I had seen his work before I had read your poem. Although mm -hmm. I had heard of the poem, I hadn't mm -hmm. read it. Right? Sure. Because, and then when I went back and I looked carefully at the work, I knew that in the poem there was going to be a description of, you know, the the man taking literally these these trees and emasculating them off the earth. And I was wrong. Exactly. They're not there. I know. It was so brilliant in the film. I mean, it was... And it's a brilliant example of using what's there because they hadn't planned that. And when they went back to the scene to actually shoot it the day after they had figured out where they wanted to shoot it, these machines were there. And James realized the way that way that became a uh, an emblem of his whole relation to life. Um... And it was really, it's very brilliant. And, uh, um, but it's not something he could have planned. But what he did is see that it was there to be used and could be used. Um, that's marvelous. I know, and it's not in the poem at all.